Hey good people, it is Tashara from Politics and Fashion here today with a very impromptu video. I'll be honest. Um, I tend to plan out my content sometimes 30 days, 60 days in advance and so I don't do a lot of kind of in the moment videos any longer. But when I tell you the spirit hit me on this topic, the spirit hit me. Like literally I was like, God, oh, okay, let me be, <laughs> let me be obedient pull out my camera and share with you kind of what's been in my mind for a while about the things that I wish I would have known when entering this industry full time or even getting started in this industry 10 years ago. And when I mention industry, I'm talking about content creation. If you're not new around here, then you may know that I started on December 22nd, 2020, my journey as a full time solopreneur. And what that means for me is that I split my time between building the brand politics and fashion on social media, YouTube, my website, newsletter, products, services, etc. And I am also an equity consultant and I use my background as an attorney in that field. And so I have these two prongs of my business. That is where uh, this title of politics and fashion came from many, many years ago. This idea that I am a lover of fashion, but I'm also very much committed to social justice, okay? And I talk about that in one of my previous solopreneur videos. And so I'm really passionate about businesses and about black woman-owned businesses. And particularly in this content creation space, you may know that there is just not a lot of information. And so I have five things that no one is talking about that I want to share with y'all today. Now I am targeting kind of these five things towards people who are either in the content creation space, are looking to get in that space, or simply using, for example, social media to build their own brands outside of content creation, okay? So I have a little bit on here for everybody um, because the first one is a good one and it transcends all three of those categories. It took me years to understand this. And now I feel like I want to literally get a soap, a, a soap box, a box, stand on it in the middle of Chinatown, like the, the Hebrew Israelites, if you in DC, you know what I'm talking about, and just take out a bullhorn and just share this with everybody. Sis, you don't own IG, okay? You do not own Instagram. Now intuitively, obviously, right? Our, our name, there's only one Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> So we know we don't own it. But too often as a content creator, we move like we do. We move like everything that we know to be true rises and sets within that application. And it cannot be farther from the truth. And I know this as a content creator who makes money with brand partnerships on Instagram. Now, the reason that I'm saying this is because I feel like what I did was I spent so many years singularly focused on growing my Instagram audience. All the time that I did that, the algorithm was literally working against me. In the good old days where you would follow people, open up the app, you'd be like, oh, what's Timmy doing today? Oh, he posted that at 335. Great, it's 422. I can see, you know, chronologically the people in my life, what they're posting in the in, in the course of the day. Now you open Instagram, girl, and you've seen posts from two weeks ago. You've seen 50 ads in the matter of three scrolls, right? And I'm not trying to just completely like dump on Instagram as an application. It is one of my favorite social media platforms to use. But for a content creator, girl, it is not the end all to be all. And if you are just getting started in this space, understand that it may be difficult for you to grow. And that difficulty has nothing to do with your value as a creative person. Louder for the people in the back. The pace by which you are growing on Instagram has nothing to do with your value as a creator and a creative person. Because I feel like I really took like hits to my self-esteem when I was working really, really hard to create all of this content and then it would just not get any engagement. Not just like limited likes, but no engagement. And that still happens to me today at 25, 26,000 followers. I, I still will, you know, create a, a, a post on a Monday. And on Wednesday when I post, it literally gets a third or half of the likes. I don't know why. 
You know why I don't know? Because I don't work down at the Meta headquarters. I don't work at Instagram. Instagram is not my business. It is not the platform that I own. So for me, what I have come to understand is Instagram is meant to promote the other work that I do, that I do own. Okay, and we're going to get there in just a minute. It is a promotional resource. And the second I kind of had that psychic conversion and switched my mindset, everything fell in place. So now Instagram, if you notice, if you follow me over there, if you don't, you should. Politics and fashion are right here. Okay, now what Instagram has become, and you may have noticed this, is a place where I go to update you about what's happening everywhere else. It's a place that, honestly, I go to get you off the app to go to YouTube, to go to my website, to go sign up for my newsletter, right? I'm trying to convert people on the app. I'm not using the app as the end-all to be-all. This is even true with brand partnerships. I mean, ultimately, you get paid to convert people to a sale, not for them to just double tap on Instagram. I mean, that's great. And I think too few brands understand this, which is why they try to pay micro influencers a very um, like small amount. Um, it's because they think that following is the same thing as engagement or following is in indicative of conversion. And it's not because some of the influencers out here who have two, three hundred thousand followers, their rate of conversion is the same as mine. And it's because I have built an authentic community on Instagram and so we are organically vibing in comments we are vibing in DMs you know I'm posting things and I'm mentioning things that people have said in my DMs like I have a platform that is built on relationships and so very often my conversion rate is higher that's besides the point <laughs> The point right now is to say, with that conversion, I'm still trying to get you off of Instagram. Instagram is a promotional platform. It is a place where you can go as a creative to share your outfits, to talk to an audience, but it is not the end all to be all. End all be all, end all to be all. It ain't everything, girl. It ain't everything. Let's keep going to number two. So you might be wondering, okay, Shy, if I don't own Instagram, what does that mean for me as a content creator? And we are in a very interesting time period right now, y'all. Uh, I am of the age, I'm almost 40, where I saw the rise of not only Instagram, but I saw the death of platforms like MySpace and Vine, okay? Um, I also saw the rise of the OG Triple OG blogger, the Ami Song, Song of Style, and um, Karen Britchicks of the world, okay? And so for me, I understood content creation in a way that was much less immediate. Like I remember I would get up, obviously go to work, get to work. And my first 30 minutes of my day, how some would read the news, I would go through my blogs. And I was using a platform like, what was it called? I forget the platform where you could, it was like a, um, a feed where you could put in blog loving, I think. You could put in all your favorite blogs and you would just scroll and like actually read their blog posts, okay? So this question is, is pretty easy for me to answer because what my mind immediately goes to is I don't own Instagram, but I do own politicsandfashionblog.com. Like we got paperwork on that thing. You know, I got my, the domain and paid for the host, for the template. That is my piece of real estate on the internet. And I will always, always keep it. Sorry, it's a fire truck going by. I'm back. As I was saying, I will always keep it because unlike a platform that is owned by another entity, I get to decide what happens to politicsandfashionblog.com, okay? Um, in the example I mentioned, MySpace and Vine, those platforms are gone, girl. They have gone to glory. And I'm not saying the same thing will happen to Instagram, but in the case of Instagram, we have seen this kind of pay pay to play model where if you are a content creator you are getting increasingly um, pressured to purchase uh, promotional space in order for your content to be seen. The algorithm now controls things and they can tweak that, change that every single day. None of that is true about your own website. So I would highly encourage you, if you are a full-time content creator or you are looking to get involved, that you have a home for all your content. That really is what my blog is, okay? So you go there, it actually is integrated with my Instagram feed. 
multiple places, okay? I use a, a, a widget by a company called uh, Reward Style or Like to Know It, where you see all of my Instagram posts that you can actually shop. Uh, I have my YouTube videos embedded. I have my own products embedded. It is the hub. It is the hub for my brand. If I kept all of that stuff, well, I couldn't even have all of that stuff in one place. Let's say I only had an IG page. When IG goes down, when my account, God forbid, gets hacked, where does, how do people reach me? How do I build brand partnerships, relationships? Like, everything just goes away because I have given this other platform the power over my brand. Once again, we don't own Instagram. Figure out what real estate you want to own online, pour yourself into that, and then use social media to promote it. The other thing I will mention is also the importance of having your own products and services. I cannot underscore this enough. Um, as a full-time influencer or someone who's interested in getting into this arena, what you have to remember is the importance of having diverse streams of income, girl. You taking notes, write that down. <laughs> Determine what can be monetized within your brand. That way you don't have to wait for the big brand partnerships to come. You don't have to, you know, take a lower rate than what you feel like you're worth in your brand collapse because you just need to pay a bill that month, right? You can just start to move a little different and more freely if you have your own products and services. Not only that, but it allows you to have something that you feel incredibly passionate about and you can pour yourself into outside of just waiting for a like on Instagram. For me, uh, before I even actually left my full-time job, I had already started to dabble in this space. Um, many of you know that I'm big on productivity, on personal growth and development, and so I have a bullet journal workshop and I would give those live. It is now housed on my shop, so for folks who might be interested, you can go over to my shop and see my digital downloads. Um, I also have a 21-day happiness project that is available, and my latest ebook, How to uh, Declutter and curate a style that you love. All of these are my own. They are my products. <laughs> and I am allowed to make passive income from them because when I'm asleep, someone in the UK is downloading my ebook, is downloading my webinar, right? It is another stream of income that once you create it once in the case of the digital download, that's it, you don't have to do anything else. Having my own products and services has made such a big difference in my brand. It actually is also where a lot of my consulting work fits in, to be quite honest with you. Uh, recently, a brand hit me up and they were like, hey, we want you to come in to give a chat to our staff, honestly. Nothing to do with social media during Black History Month. And it's such a great opportunity. It's a brand that I'm very familiar with that I love and I felt honored to come in and do this. If they did not also understand <laughs> that I was a public speaker and that I had a 21 day happiness project because that's what the talk is going to surround, which is my own product, they would never have come to me, right? If they just saw me smiling with toothpaste on Instagram, no shade, no shade whatsoever because I will, if the, if the money are right, I'll smile with the toothpaste, okay? If they just saw me doing street style photos, then they never would have come to me to engage with this service that I'm actually passionate about. And so once again, I find that your own products and services allow for you to pour into your passion, but there's also value in you being able to just boss up, right? Like get out of this mindset that all you have to offer is content to be consumed by others. Because everybody you know either wants to buy something from you or they know somebody who does. You have an entrepreneur spirit already if you were drawn to this type of work. And so don't allow for that to just be limited to, you know, static images on the gram. It's other ways for you to monetize who you are and the things that you love. I'll give you an example of this. I um, got online, gave a rant, some of you I'm sure are probably familiar with, has been seen like 65,000 times, um, about white toenails and, and like my feminist view on reclaiming the word thought. 
once it was apparent that that video was going viral, I immediately got on online to figure out how could I determine a product to attach to this. It was hugely successful. I sold water bottles, I sold um, notebooks, and I sold uh, uh, bags, like beach bags, using a brand or a logo that I made on Canva in 15 minutes. It wasn't perfect. I will soon revamp it, but I was not about to make perfect the enemy of good in that moment when the brand was hot. Imagine if I would have said, well, I'm just uh, this pretty face on social media, you know, oh, I'm happy people got a bunch of laughs or people, you know, connected with the content. It is what it is and kept, and kept it moving. I would have missed out on that financial abundance that came from those products. And then later on, the partnership with another black owned brand for my white toenail season, Candle and Subsequent Rediffuser. It's a great time to remind you that the white toenail re See, the Rediffuser is available for sale at QuinnPerfumes.com. <laughs> so once again, I uh, want to definitely encourage you all to have your own products and services. The third thing I wish someone would have told me is that it's a job. I knew this intellectually, but I think there are still some days where I am very lax with my schedule because I'm still seeing this as a passion and a hobby. Now that um, perspective of it being a passion is something that drives me to create content that I love. It's why I stopped my day to film this video. But not seeing it as a full-time job is what sometimes might make the YouTube videos get posted a little bit late. Or, you know, I think, oh, nobody cares. When realistically, people do care. <laughs> they are invested. And I'm grateful for that because if they were not invested, I would not have this platform that I'm able to earn a great living from. And so as you are really deciding whether or not this is something that you want to do or you want to get deeper into it, I definitely want you to ask yourself, are you prepared for this to be your full-time job? My mom loves baking cakes. She has a rum cake that is so good. She makes a coconut cake that is absolutely amazing. But mama would not want to be a baker full-time. She doesn't want to open a bakery. It doesn't mean that she's less passionate about baking cakes, that she doesn't still love pulling out her KitchenAid mixer and whipping up something special for the holidays. But it's not what she wants to actively work towards pursuing full-time. I think the same thing is true here. Uh, do you like dressing up? Do you like, you know, taking funny videos of your family? All those things are amazing, but when it comes down to waking up at 6 a.m. to make sure that the YouTube video gets uploaded on time, when it comes down to reapplying a full face of makeup five times, changing your clothes 15 times in a day, not being present for family members' calls because you're creating content, when it comes down to those things, because everything takes sacrifice, are you willing to do it and that's just a question that I think you should ask yourself um, and I am absolutely not complaining I'm just recognizing that I find myself kind of pulling back when it starts to feel like a job when realistically that's when I need to lean in because it is a job <laughs> and if you adopt that mindset earlier I think it's going to bring a lot of success I look at people who are creating content online who I absolutely admire like a Karen Britchick like a High Low Lux like a Monroe Steele and it's something that they all have in common and it is their like unfallible consistent and professionalism that is what it's going to take to be successful and even then if you are a woman of color it may not be enough because we already know the huge pay inequities that exist in this field so be prepared to work hard sis and something good always comes from hard work next up I wish someone would have told me to niche down and I shouldn't say no one told me this I just think that that process has to be 
consistent. Like you have to consistently be fine tuning and refining your brand and communicating that effectively to people. Because if you live up to people's own, own devices, they will take any and everything that resonates with them from your brand and then begin to marginalize or categorize you in that space specifically. For example, here lately, a lot of people have been calling me a luxury blogger or a luxury YouTuber. It's a title that I will take. However, I know that it's so much more to my brand than that. So I've been thinking, okay, Shy, so they got the luxury stuff. How can I get them to understand the other components? And that's what I mean by niching down. What is it about your brand that makes you special, that makes you unique? I was speaking to Jessica from the Catch Me If You Can about this recently. We went live one Saturday morning, just a randomly girl, had a really good kiki. And uh, she talked about how important it has been for her to just have a brand philosophy and, and, and message. Like she can just spit it out at a drop of a dime. She is a travel expert and the only black woman in the world to have gone to every single country period 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 right um a tremendous tremendous accomplishment and um brands understand her for that the world understands her for that you don't go to jessica for baking you don't go to jessica to find out what the the hottest shoes are now these are things that naturally jessica may be interested in just using her as an example but that's not what her brand and her business is built around and so the same thing for you there may be 25 things that you love what are you going to build your business around some of that may be what you're the, the most passionate about. Some of it may also just be kind of strategic. Um, I know, for example, if you are someone who is in the beauty, clothes, fashion space, um, content that is around beauty, skincare, makeup, tends to demand a higher coin because those brands are looking for more influencers to partner with, okay? So if that is one of your interests, you may decide, okay, let me niche down and lean in there. And then I'll give the girls some fashion content along the way. I'll give them vlogs and then share some of my other interests. For me, for example, y'all know I love fashion. I mentioned now being considered this luxury uh, vlogger, a blogger, but I'm also really into productivity, into self-care because of me being a breast cancer survivor, and I love interior decor. So I gotta figure out how now to show you those things without losing the primary message that I have here around my brand, which is going to always be fashion. So sis, I wish someone would have told me to niche down and to do it early. Come in, come in the game with a roadmap. Come into the game already knowing what your brand is and being able to say that succinctly. And the last thing no one talks about is very apparent and that is money. No one talks about money and it is upsetting me and my home girl. I, I just, I don't understand what is the problem with just sharing income in real numbers, okay? What I earn ain't gonna be what you earn. It won't take away from what you earn. What you earn is not going to line my pockets nor increase my bank account. We are different people operating in different worlds, even if the things that we are focused on are the same. And so what you may find is even with a good Google search, it is going to be difficult to just get a baseline of how much money is in this industry and how much you should be charging. Now, this is frustrating for many, many reasons, but as I mentioned before, paying it equities right there some would say is about a 35 percent I read recently difference in what white influencers get paid versus black so 35 percent more that is the highest of any other industry that is the highest pay gap in any other industry and I would stand to say it's probably even wider because so much income in this space goes unreported just to be honest with you so, um, you, you know, you, we have to start talking about money. We have to start encouraging influencers, black influencers especially, to understand their worth, double it, and then add tax to it. Um, I heard Karen Brickchick say in a video that she charges about 4% of her following for an Instagram post. And that was honestly the most concrete advice I had ever heard from either an influencer or someone on the other side of the industry. And it was incredibly helpful. 
I'm lucky because at that point it was in alignment with the rate that I was currently charging but I had also heard something wow like you know charging 1% of your following or you know 0.1% uh, of your following whatever it was it was this really ridiculous number and I was like why would I ever charge $250 for an Instagram post as someone who's been doing this work for a decade and ha has a photographer has a content calendar is creating a professional level con level content that sounds ridiculous because it was <laughs> because it was and there are other people Nicki Minaj has this thing where she talks about how um you know when certain men walk into a venue and they're you know backstage everything that has been included on their rider is backstage waiting for them literally on a platter and those same people will give her pickle juice when she shows up and she talked about how she has had to be transparent about not accepting the pickle juice, even if that meant being given the label of difficult or being a B-I-T-C-H, whatever it may be, what she said is, I know my worth. And if I don't tell you that I don't want the pickle juice, that the pickle juice ain't good enough for me, the next time I come to your venue, guess what you're going to give me? You're going to give me more pickle juice. And so... You know, I would say to you, you know, know what your worth is. And once again, double it and add tax because the government going to come for theirs. That's that's a different story for a different day. But I often feel like if the number that I'm sending to a brand does not scare me, then it's not high enough. If the brand gets back to me immediately, then I have shot myself in the foot. If I don't put someone in a position to negotiate with me and I am more than comfortable doing so, if I don't put someone in a position to negotiate with me, then the question is, have I charged enough? I am more than content to walk away understanding that if you can't meet my price, I am better off going in a different direction because here's true thesis, they will come back. Do what you do. Continue to grow your brand. They will come back. And so right now I am in a space where I am charging between a thousand and fifteen hundred, usually more like fifteen hundred, for a post on IG that also includes two IG stories. Um, I don't partner with a lot of brands, which is fine by me. I am so grateful for the ones who do understand the value of my content, who do understand my engagement rates, who do privilege that and want for our businesses to have a collaboration because at that point I think that it is intentional and that it is truly a meeting of the minds. Anyone else? <laughs> Too bad so sad, right? Because once again, we have diverse streams of income. Those brand partnerships are just one drop in a larger bucket. As you are determining your price, I definitely recommend doing a bit of research, seeing what it is that you can find. That's what I initially did. If the numbers or the rates that you see do not sit right with, with you, then hey, ignore it and do you, sis. I had about 4,000 followers and I worked with a um state travel agency and got paid like I think $750 um, and then more if you included like what they gave me for travel and then they paid on Ray to um, photograph us now or to photograph me. Now I am more than aware that that may have been kind of outside of the industry norm or very in industry specific price but what it told me was what I had the potential to earn on a consistent basis. Most importantly, what it told me was that there was value in the content that I was creating. And so keep at it. Do not allow for these prices that people will come into your inbox with to dictate your value and your worth in the same way the likes don't dictate your value and your worth. And ensure that you are charging a price that you feel like is representative of the content that you are creating. And that is it, good people. Thank you so much for watching today's video. If you have enjoyed it, make sure you give it a thumbs up and you are subscribed to my channel. Leave a comment down below. How did these five things resonate with you? Do you have any additional questions? I would love to chat. In the meantime, I will see you good people across the internet. Peace.